Okay? Let me turn my phone off. It was playing music. All right, go ahead. <laughs> it's lab 11. Yeah, lab 11. I take one of my JavaScript example for class and uh, make it own content. Right? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, we haven't gone over JavaScript yet. Uh, I'm going to do a couple uh, simple examples oh, okay. in class, like how to do an image swap. That's a classic JavaScript one where you have thumbnails on the page. You put the mouse over a thumbnail, the image changes. So I'll do a few examples in class. I just want you to take something I did and like adapt it and change it for something that you did. Okay. So we don't do tons of JavaScript in this class, so I don't really require you to write something from scratch. It's more of a, okay, you know, I can, that, that's sort of the first step of understanding code is being able to take someone else's code and alter it to do what you want it to do. So um, that, that's what that one's about. All right. Going to go over forms today. And we left off, um, I think we did uh, a, drop down and a radio button, I think. Um, and we're going to talk about other form controls. And we're going to talk about HTML5 form controls and a few other things. And we might get into tables today. Um, let me pull down the example that we had. You missed a very lively discussion about birds oh, well, and, birds. and geese oh. <laughs> and how mean geese are yeah. and how big ostrich eggs are. And the people in the online class, you missed it as well. It's, it's a shame. I wish you, you could all be here. I'll spend a minute to review this, and then we'll talk about some other things. I think I will go kind of off the grid. Not off the grid, but I think I will deviate from the example and start a new example after we spend a minute to review it. This is week 13 already. Can you be even believe that? Next week is Thanksgiving week, right? Okay. I got to eat another big bird, right? It all comes back to birds. I do remember the first time I saw turkeys in the wild, and it was like right over there, I'm pointing out, uh, like past the last building on the road there. I forget what the road's called. But I saw them crossing the street, and I had no idea what they were. It's like they looked like dinosaurs or something. They looked like some weird, ancient thing. And I like took pictures of them and I posted to Facebook like, what are these things? You know, should I be worried? You know, <laughs> does, does the government need to know about this or, or what? But then people are like, well, those are just turkeys. I'm like, oh, okay. So then I was better. <laughs> but the way they move, they move so slow and yeah, like, like exactly. I don't know what the word for that is. Like, like lurching. Flow. Yeah. <laughs> They were kind of creepy, they, I have to say. Uh, OK, so here's what we had. We had two versions of this form that did a Google search. And um, the difference being that we used a drop down and radio buttons for the language choice. <coughs> so we could put something in, search in a different language, and our search results would be uh, in that language. And again, the way we did that is we sort of re reverse engineered the form to look what it expected those f uh, fields to be called, what script is being called, and so on. And here we used. Um, uh, radio buttons. Let's bring these up real quickly.
All right, a few things I want to illustrate. Number one, I put the whole form in an unordered list. Um, that makes most sense to me, and it is nice. It lends itself to good styling. Because typically you want forms to be stacked vertically anyhow. Um, and really, what is a form? A form is really a list of stuff that you're sending to the server, if we're going to break it down into simple terms. Um, and therefore, we make an unordered list. Um, each form item, then, becomes its own little um, li. We have a label for each form element, which is largely for accessibility reasons. Uh, and um, for people that can see, this is one of those things that you don't even really think about, but people that can see, it's easy to tell that this label belongs with this box. But if you have a screen narrator reading it to you, the manner in which it reads it, it's not always obvious what belongs with what. So this sort of attaches it by using the ID to connect with the ID. All right. A form element will typically have both a name and an ID. You use the ID for the label, you use the name, because that's what the server is expecting at the other end. OK? And in this case, I knew the language, uh, or I'm sorry, the query is AS underscore Q. And the type of it is text, so I get a text box. The language, again, in this instance, I have a radio button with the labels. Um, type radio, the name for a radio button group is all the same. That's what ties them together and makes them act like radio buttons. All right? The ID is going to be different. Always an ID is going to be unique. All right? So you're never going to have two things, or you shouldn't have two things with the same ID on a page. So radio button, same ID, I'm the, oh, just the opposite. Same name, different ID for each one. Finally, the submit button is what actually finalizes it and sends it to the server so that the server can process it. Your choices are get or put on the, for the method, and the action is the name of the script. Get will send it via the query string. Put will send it uh, a different way. All right, I'm going to create another form now different than the one that I did uh, here. And we're going to use that to explore some of the other fields that you have. So let me cop one, copy one of these. And I'll keep the same style as I put different things on the page. We've gone over text boxes and um, radio buttons and drop downs. So let me go over a couple other uh, examples. One thing I do oftentimes, is I'll make the name and the ID the same. I made them different so you wouldn't get them confused. But it's a nice little convention to make them the same. That that's also can be something straightforward. All right, so I'm just making a name field here. And I'm going to put the next thing, we've already gone over radio, bu uh, radio buttons and drop downs, so in the interest of time, I won't do them again. I'll do a checkbox, though. So, add to mailing list. That very famous checkbox that you see on a lot of uh, forms. Or agree to terms and conditions, the one that people check without ever reading it.
I really wonder, like, you know, what they could slip in there. Like, I sign over my car if I agree to join this and someone will show up one day. Well, where's your car? A checkbox is where you have um, two options, checked or unchecked. Input type equals check. And this is important. It will again have a name and an ID. And I'll use the same for both. It will then have a value. And the value is the value that it gets if it's checked. So I'll make the value to this Y. If it's checked, it will send a Y on the query string. If it's not checked, it will send nothing. That's kind of a little unusual about that. It's a little different than the other ones. Uh, the other ones always send a value one way or another. Checkbox doesn't always send a value. All right. Now I'm going to change the action of the form. What's the action again? The action of the form is... Um, where we're sending the form to be processed. And I've ran across for my University of Akron class a cool little website that I'm looking for now that allows you to sort of practice send data to a server if you want to practice forms. And let me This is an author, I think, of the textbook that we use in that class. But he set up a little website that Randy Connolly dot com slash tests slash process dot PHP. PHP being one of the script one of the languages that server side scripts are written in. So if we take this, if I take this form and view it, I lied. But my lie exposed something important. It's type equals checkbox, not check. All right, so there's a checkbox. Notice what happened when I put in something the browser didn't understand. I put in a type that the browser didn't understand. It changes it to a text box. So the default for an input item is a text box. And if you give it something valid like radio or checkbox instead of check or whatever, if the browser doesn't know what that is, it makes it into a text box. It's like sort of the simplest form control that there is, a, a text box. Remember that theme when we get to HTML5 controls. Because with HTML5 controls, that's actually something that's important. All right? At any rate, I go and I type this in. I type in the name, Mike, add to mailing list. I click the search button, and that sends and that shows me the get and the post data. The get data is the data on the query string. The post data is the data that is sent other ways. I lied a second time today. It's not get and put, it's get and post. I am just confusing a bunch of languages today. So now if I put it in, if I change that to post instead of get, notice the get data is empty and the post data is filled up. So this just demonstrates that there's two ways to send data. Um, there's reasons why you would do one versus the other. Um, 
I could actually take a link and hard code a Google search link uh, to say, like, if you want to, to search for something, you know, you go here, and it will show me, uh, you know, it, it'll show me the, the search results without the user having to type anything in. If you pass something on the query string, you can make a link out of it and just put it on your page. You might not want to do that, though. You might want to not want to do that for a login. So you sort of send the information uh, in a hidden way on the post. But anyhow, this allows us to practice without uh, knowing, uh, without, without having a server-side script. All right, some other things that we have. We have a text area. A text area <coughs> is for multi-line comments. A text box is for one line of text. A text area is for when you have multiple lines of text. So it would be good for something like comments. So I can put that in. Almost any of these I can put a value in if I want to. And we'll talk about defaults in a second. And I lied again. I am not very truthful today. It's not input type equals text area. It's just plain text area. This is one thing that's a little inconsistent with the design of the forms because a lot of them are simply input tags with a certain type. And then for a lot of them, there's actually separate tags, like the drop down and a text area actually have their own tag. All right, so if I go and view this now, notice I get multiple lines. And I can, of course, style that to be as big as I want. So I could say text area, I want to be have a height of 100 pixels, a width of 200 pixels. And it'll size it that big. Unless you want to do the thing where you give them an area for comments and you just give them one pixel by two pixel. Go ahead and type in what you want to complain about here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's all right. I came across, I guess, an interesting anomaly in the text area. Uh-huh. Sometimes you can. Not, not. I, I don't think every text area you can. Let's see. Can we do it with this one? Oh, this is. Uh, this isn't Chrome. Let's open Chrome. Oh yeah. I guess you do. Cool. And why would you not want to allow people to resize it? Um, I know that there's other elements around the layout. Uh, I, right. I mean, I, I can see that. But as a general rule, one thing that you would want to do is, you know, where possible, give the users as much options as possible. So I, I agree. If you did want to do it, if you had a very specific design, that it had to look a certain way, and that really blew the design, then yeah, maybe maybe uh, do that. But if you can think of working it in such a way where that wouldn't ruin the design, then then if possible, it's a good idea to do that. And I didn't realize that. That's, that's a cool feature. I actually like that. All right. Um, let's see. What else is there? 
Um, I'm going to Google real quick to see if I'm not missing anything. I know there's at least two more, one of which we're never going to use, though. No. There's at least three more, one of which we're never going to use. One of them is a password. And a password would be where you don't want to um, echo the, the, what the user types in. So like, for example, um, if you, uh, you know, like a password field. Or, um, like a credit card number. All right. So we'll put a password on here. Notice as we type in here, whoa. Oh, I forgot to type. Can tell us a Monday. As we type that in, it isn't displayed. So I, I've seen that like done with credit card numbers as well and all that. On mobile browsers, sometimes there's a little eyeball there that allows you to click on it and see what you typed in, simply because typing on a mobile device is a little harder than typing on a, a keyboard. Now notice something I alluded to before but didn't talk about. If I check on add to mailing list, it sends mailing equals Y. If I do not check it, it sends nothing. All right, it's a sort of a quirk of this. The other thing is if I omit a name on a field, like let's say I forget the name password here. It doesn't send it. So you have to have a name for a field in order to send it to the server. Okay, two other things. One is just a plain old button. Instead of type equals submit, we say type equals button. All right. And type equals button. I sometimes typing on a regular keyboard is difficult as well. Type equals button will if you press it, nothing happens. All right, and that kind of sounds useless. Well, why have it if nothing happens? What that simply means is there's no default behavior tied to a button. A submit button has a default behavior. The default behavior being send it to the server, send it to whatever script we have on the server, and send the data this way, get or post. A plain old button doesn't have any default behavior. And when we start talking about JavaScript, we will talk about how you can write JavaScript to handle when a button is clicked. So typically, a plain old button does some JavaScript on the client side. So I can do a little demonstration of that. Oh, gigantic difference. 
it's not a matter. It's, it's like what what's better, a car or a steak dinner? Steak dinner. <laughs> well, if you had to get to Cleveland from here, steak dinner, you know, maybe you could bribe someone with a steak dinner, but you know, they're used for two different things, so it's not. Okay, uh, possibly. Um, but the idea is that they do different things, so you can't say which is better, you know. Um, and when we'll see, when we go over JavaScript, we'll see the kinds of things that JavaScript does. Uh, the JavaScript adds interactivity to the page. The CSS uh, adds styling and appearance to the page. There are a handful of things. Now, to, to, to get back to your question, which is better, there are a handful of things that you can do either via JavaScript or via CSS. For example, changing something when you mouse over it. You can actually do that in JavaScript and you can do that in uh, CSS. So something like that maybe you could dis discuss the pros and cons. But for the most part they do such different things that it's, it's, there's not that much overlap. But here's a little snippet of JavaScript. This is just going to display a message saying hello. Not a particularly interesting piece of JavaScript, but now the, the button does something because I put in a little snippet of JavaScript. So generally that's what you do. You put in uh, a snippet of JavaScript. The one that we're not going to use, and I'm going to do this, but please don't ever use it on a form. There, there are some very rare cases where maybe it would come in handy, but generally it doesn't. And that is the reset button. The reset button clears out the form and sets everything to the default values. Well, what's so bad about that? Well, very rarely does that come in handy. If I start to fill this in, I go Mike, add to mailing list, comments, and I write some gigantic con comment in here, and I go to submit this, and I'm not careful, I'm liable to click, oh, okay, let me send this to the server, boom. Oh, crap. I reset it, right? People accidentally hit the reset button and it takes, it takes away everything from the form, all right? If I did fill stuff in the form, all right, and, whoa, I want to start from scratch, it's not that hard to go boom, boom, and retype it. Or, at the very least, I could refresh the page if it was that bad if it was a gigantic form that I had all kinds of garbage in. Like, wait a minute, I'm not Mike. Uh, that's not my address. That's not my phone number. I am John, and this is my address. You know, I mean, if there was a case like that where you had to go and delete everything and start from scratch, it would be better to reset that. Because people accidentally go and click, click the reset button and cause it to lose it. So very little advantage. Definitely a a uh, uh, definitely a uh, uh, disadvantage as well. Let me look to see. Because LC's web page used to have a horrible example of this, but they may have revised it. So let me see. Um,
wonderful. Oh, well. Okay. Let's see if it's a browser thing. Okay, never mind. Let me describe to you what LC's page used to have. Again, I'm not doing this to bash the website. Um, but they used to have a page where there was a whole bunch of search criteria. You could search for the days of the week that you wanted classes for. You could search for the title of the class. You could put in the professor that you wanted. Interestingly enough, you couldn't put in the professor you did not want. All right? Because that could be valuable too, right? All right, but anyhow, that's neither here nor there. But the bottom line is there's a whole bunch of fields to, that you could enter in. There was a search, and there was a reset button. They're right next to each other, all right? And they look the same virtually. And if I'm not mistaken, the reset button was, at, button was actually a little bit bigger. So you don't know how many times me not even looking for an example for class wanted to look for classes and I clicked the search button, thinking I clicked the search button and clicked the reset button and it reset it. Now, if you insist that there needs to be a, re, uh, a reset button, what would be some things that you could do to improve this design? Yeah, move the reset button so it's not right next to the search button. Definitely. Put it in a less easily found place. All right. Um, visually show them as different. Show the, the uh, search button as green, maybe, and bold. Yes. You could do an are you sure message if that didn't get in the way. Uh, but there's a lot of things that you could do to, to, to do that. So uh, that was such a horrible piece of design in my uh, book because it, it offered little advantages and offered uh, oh, you know, a lot of accidental clicking on that. And that gets to just the whole sense of defaults, all right? We can default just about anything on a form. Let me, let me copy over the language to this form. The name I could default by putting in a value. Things in text boxes you normally don't default though. Default though. I don't know. What would be a default name? Bob? All right. It is now. All right. Uh, add to mailing list. We could say checked. Or if you're a purist like me, you'd say checked equals checked. Comments, you could put a value in the same way. Password, I guess that doesn't make sense to default. Uh, language, let me move that up a little bit. And you can do this both for a radio button or a drop down, so I'll only do one example of it. Um, You can say on an option, you can say selected, or if you're a purist, you can say selected equals selected. All right. And I messed up the radio button, I think. Let me look at that. Add to mailing list. Oh, the default for the comments you put between the start and end tag. My mistake. Uh, 
the radio button. Right. At one point, uninstalling Internet Explorer was a chore. Right. Oh, chat. For radio button, it's checked. For drop down, it's selected. So I will do. I will do the drop down as well, because the drop down is a little different. This should be checked equals check, just like a checkbox. And the drop down is selected. I'll pick a different default on this one. Okay, so there you notice that that's default, that's default. Okay, now when do you use defaults? You use defaults when um, your thought is that most of the people would benefit from having a default because that saves a field that they have to select. So if I was in a, uh, if I was in a site in France, maybe I would default the language to France. All right. Uh, if I was uh, a site in Poland, maybe I'd defi to, default it to Poland. I might give other options, but I would default it to what I thought the majority of people were. Uh, for example, uh, if there was an application for Lorain County Community College, probably most of the people applying, uh, the state that they would live in would be, the, uh, would be Ohio. So I'd default it to Ohio. That saves people having to do it, but gives the opportunity to you to override the default if you, if you don't want to. The problem with the default is if, you're, if your user's careless, they're liable to just ignore the field and accept the default when it's not relevant. So you have to be careful about that. So don't make something a default unless it's truly a default. Sometimes I'll have students, like when we talk about JavaScript validation and making sure that the user entered everything on the form, will say, well, I'll just make defaults. All right, and that way I won't have to worry about uh, um, doing, uh, you know, uh, doing validation. Well, that that doesn't work. All right, you should only use a default when it's truly a default. So, Bob, no, that's not a good name. All right, uh, add the mailing list. Generally speaking, they do default it to true. Why? Because they're being a little tricky there, a little sneaky, because they want you to say yes, so they default it to yes. Uh, Something like language, well, if you knew something about your audience and you knew predominantly what language they'd be speaking, then have that as a default. One thing about a drop-down list is if you don't choose a default, the top item is defaulted. Whereas a radio button, if you don't choose a default, none of them are defaulted. So here I didn't choose a default for the drop down and the radio button. The top drop down is included. Uh, the top drop down options included none of the radio buttons. If there truly isn't the default, so that's another way you can sort of set a default on a drop down is just make the top item that. If there truly was no default, though, you could put a dummy option at the top. And why do I keep pasting instead of copying? So I could put a dummy option that said, Select your language. Not to random form without selection, what would happen to your 
Well, as is written now, it would send it to the server with language NA, because that was the value of that choice, and it would be up to the server to, uh, to handle that. I could write JavaScript, though, that said that you must make one of the other selections, though. And that's what, when we get into JavaScript, form validation is done with that. Um, one other thing I can do is, let's see. Oh, I can also arrange the items in a drop-down like the, in the order that I would expect them. So, for example, if I was doing a, some, uh, a website for North America, I might have uh, the, you know, uh, U.S., Canada, Mexico on the top of the list with the other North American countries and then have the list of other countries. <coughs> Alphabetical is always a good organization or in terms of the most common, the most used is a, is a good other organization. All right. Um, there is uh, another tag that we can do that helps with accessibility and helps with the design of a page or a form specifically, and that is a field set. A field set allows us to group forms stuff into uh, other uh, into sections. So what I could do is I could create in my form a field set. And I could then give a legend to describe what the section of the form was about. So maybe the top of the form is personal information. And the next part of the form is languages. I need a start tag. Yes, thank you. I also need a start UL tag because I close that other unordered list. And I need to put the end field list here, field set here. Now if I do this, I get a legend and I get a little, little border around it. And again, those are defaulted. If I want something different, I can always change it. Let me show you the code because I had the screen off. Field set, legend. Let me also turn, I did turn, let me turn the default back on. For these, because I took those off. All right, and of course I can style it. So I could say legend, font size, two pixel or two em, color blue. field set, background, pound sign, CCC, border, 3px, solid, black,
I get something that looks like that. Which again, it does a couple things. Uh, field set uh, can be used for accessibility purposes. Field sets can also uh, just you know visually make the form more appealing and more organized. So you can see you can see things that are grouped up, grouped together. One thing that you can do if you truly have a long form is that you can use multiple pages. That requires client or server-side scripting to accomplish. So we won't cover that in this class. I'll post example, this example, I'm sorry that I did not um, have the projector on correctly uh, for that section. The last topic that we have to get for this, and I'm just going to introduce it, and we will go over it in more detail next time, is HTML5 controls. What I've showed you this part, this part, up to this part of the discussion, was stuff that was around in HTML4 and even earlier. All right? HTML5, again, is the improved version of HTML, where they've made some more tags that can handle some things specifically and do a better job. We saw how there's now a header, a nav, and so on. The people who developed that language looked at some common things that were done and said, you know what, it would be great if there was a tag that handled this. And they made one. All right. HTML5, what they did with forms was... Was what? Where's HTML5? They don't want it. Well, let's let's do another search. HTML5 form elements. These are just plain old HTML elements. We scroll at the bottom, ah, here are some. Uh, neither the browser nor me seems to be working very well today. And I'll tell you what, we'll just cover it next time. There's a list of things that are new in HTML5 that are sort of more specialized version of the input tag. You can create an, uh, uh, or the, yeah, the, uh, the text tag. So you can create, for example, a text box that only accepts dates, all right, which is nice. Uh, previous to that, you would put any kind of data in a text box, and then you'd have to write JavaScript validation to do that. There's a catch, though. All right, not all browsers support all the HTML5 tags, input tags. We'll cover that. We'll spend maybe 10 minutes on that, and we'll get into tables uh, next time. So, again, we missed one la one class, so we're about one class behind. If you do need to turn in things late, um, that's okay. All right, we'll see you up in lab.